Welcome to On The Beat Live, Inside Carolina's only live YouTube podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. And with On The Beat Live comes Gregory Hall running the wheels, keeping the train on the track. Speaking of trains, Solaire just hit one off the train in World Series for the Braves. And Greg Barnes, our World Series expert, beat writer, for Carolina, hey, you got to come up. You, you got to come <laughs> up with um, adjectives to describe Greg Barnes and his coverage. I don't know. I've covered I don't know if baseball four guys. college World Series. How about that? Yeah, see, World Series covering <laughs> Greg Barnes, beat writer. I mean, it's all it, it's all relative and all relevant. Speaking of relevant, wow, what a segue! Second, I have to show we will have. The relevant one, Sherelle McMillan, join us to talk a little Carolina basketball. I see what, I see what you did there. That was uh, It was not planned, but it worked out. But let's get straight into the football team. Uh, I freely admit I did not listen to the player press conferences today, but, Greg, I did listen to the coaches. I'm not sure what to think. <laughs> you know, it's uh, the Notre Dame game is what it is. Um, ifs and ifs and buts, candy and nuts, and all that kind of stuff. Carolina just could not make a play in a very winnable game. After hearing the coaches and the players today, Greg, what is your takeaway about where this team is going into this Wake Forest game at noon on Saturday? I think it's very clear to me that the team right now, and Max spoke to this yesterday, but the, the team right now is entirely focused on the present. And what I mean by that is they understand that – some of these things that happened early in the season, it wasn't just rust. It wasn't just kind of, you know, the chemistry thing. It wasn't just that. There's more to it. Um, I mean, there are there are issues at hand. I think the troubling thing is that if, if you look at the offense from the Blacksburg game to now, uh, you've seen a, a positive trajectory. It hasn't always been – on the up and up, right? I mean, there's been some some bad stretches at Georgia Tech was pretty pretty poor. Florida State was a little bit hit or miss. But we've seen that group get better, and they looked really good in South Bend. I mean, that, that's a solid Notre Dame defense. Maybe not as good as last year's. That is a good defense. Probably one of the better ones that, that North Carolina has played. Possibly the best they've played thus far. Offense looked great. And Sam Howe talked about that, how you know because they've changed scheme a little bit and they've really emphasize getting the ball to different people, all of a sudden the offense opens up and they looked really good. That's positive moving forward. Defensively, I don't think you can say that. I, I they, They've switched out some pieces. Uh, Cedric Gray, of course, is getting a lot more playing time. But, I mean, Jason Staples did a really good job breaking down that 91-yard touchdown run that Kyron Williams had. And there's like three or four guys – making mistakes on that one play. And I understand people want to talk about the officiating. ACC officiating sucks. This is put it out there. I mean, if you watch the Pittsburgh-Miami game, whoo, I mean, some bad calls. Um, I've, I've, I've played two-hand touch rougher with kids in the neighborhood than some of those roughing the, the passer calls that Pitt had against in the first half. It was ridiculous. I mean, guys, are they're pushing like that, and they're getting flagged. This is poor officiating, and then, of course, the, the safety call there at the end. Um, and Carolina had some bad calls go against them. You can, emphasize, you can talk about you know, that holding, potential holding call that should have been called uh, in favor of Miles Murphy. But you have to handle your business. You can't control what the officials do. You can control what you do. And if North Carolina on that particular play – if those guys had been where they were supposed to and they gave the effort they were supposed to, Williams would have been stopped for 15, 20 yards, not 91. Theoretically, he could have been stopped for a four-yard loss. Right, yeah, if Tamon well, Fox can well, run through him. That wasn't even Tamon because Tamon hit him on the other Gray side for positive – that was, would have been positive yards. He was hit four yards behind the line of scrimmage on the right side. Right. That was not Miles Murphy. Yes, Miles Murphy was held. It was Vahasek getting pushed out or getting his hand on him. But yeah, I don't want, I didn't mean to cut you off, Greg, but do your job in that play. And the outcome of the play is better than if they had called the hold. 
because it would have been first down from the three. Whereas if you make a tackle like they should have made is second down and 13 or whatever it is. I a hundred percent agree. Officiating sucks period. And it bites Carolina in the butt more often than not. It appears maybe because that's what we follow, cover and watch the most, but you can't control it and make plays and do your, do what you're supposed to do. And the officials turn irrelevant. Roy Williams, Good players beat bad refs. What, and what did he say about Hansbro? Didn't matter. Whatever you want to do with Hansbro. Hansbro would go to the rim, get massacred, Broke and then after nose? the play, he'd be like, what, "That was a foul." Oh, okay, I'll shoot free throws. I understand. Um, Kyron Williams is a good running back and will probably be a solid backup, if not starter, one day in the NFL. But Tamon Fox has six and a half more inches. And seventy more pounds, and you have to win your one on one. You can't right. get you can't get face mat or uh, stiff armed into the ground like that. You just can't, especially when you have the initial leverage. And I think that right. goes back to the defense as far as yes, Jay Bateman discusses execution. The players discuss execution. Jeremiah Gimmel after the game discuss when you're one, you're one of elevens, and that is a crucial one of eleven that was not won. And yes, other plays and other mislapses and other issues happened, but that is a when we, when the players when Jay Bateman talks about execution and when you're one of elevens, and UNC has not been good at setting the edge, especially against running quarterbacks. Where this is against a running back, where the desi- the play was running to the right, and Tamon Fox was in his spot, ready for the bounce back to the left, and still lost his one on one, and then the rest was. 91 yards and a touchdown. So I think when we talk about execution issues, there's none more prevalent than that right there. Correct. And that's a great example. Yeah, that play summed up Carolina's defense. Right. So I think at this point of the season, we're eight games in, and a lot of the same mistakes are happening over and over again. And so while we're seeing the offense get better and make significant strides, we have not seen that out of the defense. Um, And so in listening to the coaches – before I, you know, getting back to my original point before I got off on the tangent on the official, the official call, or officiating calls, um, it, it really is about getting better today, especially defensively. Um, and that's taking the right angles, it's making tackles, it's being in the right gap, all these things that shouldn't be a problem, but yet they are a problem. You've got to get that addressed. And, I, you know, Max acknowledged it, and I, we have too. We, we thought this was a team that was going to take care of business and they were going to win a lot of the games ahead of them. And there are going to be certain games that we could circle. It's okay. Keep winning. You know, take care of business. Get to this game. It's going to be a big deal. We make a big deal about it. That hasn't happened. Every game is a grind for this team, especially defensively. Um, and the two hardest games are the next ones, which is not good. So they have to focus on the, the minutia of it, on the – specific details of how to get better without worrying about the opponent, without worrying about you know, getting to a bowl game. Um, I mean, they've got to go back to the basics, and I think they're doing that. But they have to make significant strides. We, we talked early in the year, Tommy. Uh, you, yeah, they played good in Blacksburg. But they, they really haven't shown it. Um, and it's, it's been stagnant um, since we really last year. And I, I think it's a problem, and it's something that – the coaches have to take ownership of, and they have to correct it uh, sooner than later. And we can talk about the talent on hand. We can talk about recruiting going along well, all these things. But if you don't get the, the coaching aspect of it right to where the guys know where they're supposed to be every single play, it doesn't matter what your talent level is. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the key for this team, especially defensively. Is they've got to really focus on the next day just to give themselves a chance to be able to win some of these games. That's the thing about, you know, the debate in the chat is, is it coaching or is it players? Well, it's, it's some of both, right? Sure. If a player's in position to make a play, he's got to make it. But then who coached him to make it? And the issues with me um, and, and that I've said, and Greg, I think you may agree with this, and Greg, are you as well, is it's the same mistakes from different players over a course of three seasons. And that, I think, 
that's important that's what you just said as far as it's different players. If it was the same guy, the same two or three guys over and over and over again, then that's where the bench is the motivator, right? But when it's 1 through 11, and yes, some guys are making more mistakes than others, right? We're rarely talking about mistakes a guy like Tony Grimes makes, right? And he hasn't been perfect in coverage, but we're still – we're not really talking about his mistakes as much as some other guys, right? But they're still – it's not like someone's like, oh, like – Man, it's only if the other ten guys could do what this one guy's doing, you know. Like, and I think I think that's an important point. It's everywhere. It's not one guy not doing his job, like that ninety-one yard run shows, which I think ninety-six of that was after contact, which is yeah. unheard of. Yeah, <laughs> I've never heard of that. But uh, it's it's three or four or five guys making um, a bad bad play or bad angle and all that, and and those are things that coaching's got to fix. You know, if it's, and that's why I said on the day after it's a systematic failure of things. If multiple guys are doing the same things, that's what I wanted to see coming out of the bye week. I wanted to see some of those things corrected. I referenced Notre Dame coming out of their bye week. Notre Dame had given up more sacks than Carolina had coming into that game. If I'm correct, Greg, I think I'm correct. But in the last two weeks after their bye week, they went up tempo get the ball out of cone or the other guy's hand as quickly as possible and they give up none. And then they start running the football. Well, as well, like you said, Greg, I think on their fourth string left tackle or something. So there, there are things that coaches can do mid season to make differences. We didn't see that for Carolina's defense coming out of the bye week. And yes, it's execution at times, but like you said, Greg, coaches have to own it. And I haven't heard, be honest with you, and this may not be popular um, at places higher than this, is that I haven't seen much ownership of that in the press conferences by the coaches. Am I wrong there, or is it coach speak, or, you know, I, and somebody mentioned Sed Gray. Sed Gray is not the guy Jason Staples was talking about on the podcast the other day. I'll just say that because I think Sed Gray can be really good. But Greg – I'm not seeing the ownership from the coaches that maybe I would expect to see um, because when you consistently talk about execution, that seems like you're not putting it on yourself. Yeah. And it's a good point, Tommy. And I, I think it's, I think it's a little, I don't want to say vague, um, but I think it's really just kind of noisy in terms of there being a lot of moving parts uh, because as, as Jason laid out in that, that going back to that 91 yard touchdown, the scheme was good. And we've seen that time and time again this year. It's not like, I mean, in some plays it's been an issue, but it's not like you know, 2014 where Vic had just wrong people out there altogether. And you're kind of like, I mean, what is going on here? For the most part, the scheme has been really good and guys are in the right positions. But you get into the point, like we talked about, is, is execution. And guys are not able to consistently do their jobs. Yes, that's a coaching issue, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a player issue. It's a coaching issue. Um, and it's, it's not a very complicated scheme right now. There's a lot of very basic things that they're wanting the guys to do. Now, we can get in the conversation about why are guys looking over to the sidelines so often. I mean, that's a valid point. Um, so you're really in this thing of, okay, Jay's probably looking at on film saying, well, you know, it's not like the guys are not where they're supposed to be. They're just kind of getting out of position a little bit and the gap integrity is not there. So that suggests schemes. Okay. It is execution, but the coaches are responsible for making sure the guys know what to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, for the most part, Jay has stressed that aspect of it that, Hey, you know, execution, if the execution improves, everything gets better. I asked him last week, about how he thought the defense was coming along, what he what he thought the good things were, and if it had improved any. And he took ownership there. He, he said, you know what, we, we've, we've done some – had some hard conversations. You know, what can I do better as a defensive coordinator? What can my coaches do better to help these guys get in better positions? Um, that was – I think that was one time that they, he made that comment. But he has made those comments. So I, I really think there's just frustration about, okay, we've got the kids in the right spot primarily – but we're not getting them to make the plays that we need them to make. So what do you do? And I, I, I think, I think there's a lot of question marks about 
how to handle that. Um, you know, probably within the, the Keenan football center. So let, let's turn it. I mean, Notre Dame's game's over. I've really felt walking out of there that Carolina missed a golden opportunity to beat a Notre Dame team that was beatable. Just didn't get it done. Like I said, um, on the day after, you're not getting calls in South Bend, period. Cincinnati didn't need them when they went in there and beat them. But you're not getting any calls. There's a reason Notre Dame rarely loses at home, especially the unranked teams, because they're pretty good and you're not ever going to get a, a critical call. So let's turn the page on that one. Greg, let's talk about the transfers. Somebody asked, is it a cultural issue? Here's my take on transfers. I'm never going to knock a kid or a young man or young woman for that part, whoever, for trying to make a decision that betters themselves, that gives them a better opportunity of what they expect to be. Emory Simmons and Christian Varner today are the two latest to enter the portal. Can't blame them at all. Greg, the, the issue or the question is, they're not unexpected transfers, but the question I think people have is why are people transferring? Is, is, it, a, is it a cultural issue? Is it just a pure, I want to play, and this new transfer situation gives me the opportunity to play quickly or, or something else that we're missing? I think there's a couple of parts of this. Number one, what you just said is critical, especially with the midseason stuff, because as soon as you enter the portal – you can start taking official visits, which I think a lot of people probably don't know. Um, and in terms of the recruiting process, that's important. Now, the issue that Mac has pointed out and a lot of coaches have pointed out is it's not a one-for-one -one deal with kids in the portal, right? Like 10% of kids in the portal actually get picked up by a FBS school. And I, I think there needs to be greater education probably from the NCAA to these kids when they go in the portal. Of like, look, if you're in the portal, we need you to understand this is the likelihood of you getting picked up by an FBS, FBS school. This is the likelihood of a FCS school. Um, you need to understand kind of what's going to take place here. I think that's probably coming. I think it needs to happen. Um, but you know, everybody push for more opportunities for football players, I mean, student athletes in general, to have mobility. Coaches can leave whenever they want to leave. People didn't like it because players could not. Well, now players can. And so we're early in that stage, right? It's a new phase of football. And I think we're going to see more of this maybe in the next year or so before it probably settles down, once kids kind of understand what it's really about, how everybody knows how to handle the situation. Um, Mac Brown, the other part, Mac Brown is in his third year. And if the internet was around when he first came to Chapel Hill back in 88, I think people would be shocked. Right, Tommy? The number of people... <laughs> <laughs> that left I, I the was, program. I was at Carolina and new players on that team. And you talking about a mass exodus. If the transport for transfer portal existed then and you could play immediately, I'm not sure Matt could have filled a roster. Right. For sure. And that's not his – he did it the right way. But and, it is really no different than what's going on now. And that's that's the pre-85 you know, Mac scholarship deal, right? <laughs> um so he's building his culture the way he wants it. Um, and as we know, you know, Randy's done a good job tracking this over the years, but the average attrition for North Carolina over however many years is like 12 a year. So, I mean, that's a lot of kids that leave the program every single year. Now, some of it may be injuries, you know, medical redshirt, some of it's family matters, most of it's kids transferring. Um, I think they're at seven now. So we're not talking about anything out of the norm. There's probably going to be more kids that, that leave, right? So I don't think there's any indication that's a culture issue. I, mean, I think it's just it, the fact that it's happening midseason is unique. But Mac Brown also had conversations with his kids during the open day saying, hey, we had this conversation in the offseason. Let's have it again. We kind of need to know where your mind's at. We won't you to know kind of what we're thinking about where you fit into this program moving forward. And then they'll have those same conversations after the season. And that's Mac being proactive. And I actually think that's a really good thing. I think there needs to be more communication between coach and staffs and players about plans and those kind of things. The more transparency you have there, the better. Um, and I really think that's, that's it. I, mean, I think that's the, the, the bulk of the issue. It's not a culture matter. 
It's Mac implementing his culture. Um, the fact that a, you know, a number of these guys are kids that he recruited, I think is an interesting aspect of it. Uh, but I think that's a whole different conversation we can have. Well, Seth Gregory, I will say this. What's the only – I only know of one Carolina transfer in the last couple of years that plays for a Power 5 school that's done work. Who? And I'm looking at it. Noah Ruggles. He's 11 oh, for 11. Ohio State. He's 11 for 11 right now at field goals for Ohio State. He also kicks off for them. Yeah, he's doing um, well. And, and if somebody can name me another P5 Carolina transfer – I'm all ears to listen, but Greg, Gregory, what do you think about the transfer, specifically the end season thing? I think Greg explained why it's necessary, um, but give us your thoughts there. Someone in the chat said it's Mac running out the guys that he wants to run out, and I think run out might be a little strong of a term, but it's pretty accurate based on I mean, what Greg said as far as the conversations that they had during the bye week, and Mac could wait to have those conversations with the guys at the end of the season, but then it hurts – honestly the team because then you have the conversations like we're going to still be asking why isn't Emory playing what's the deal with that and those are things that you have to answer when you don't have any intent in playing a guy like Emory just based on maybe how he's performing in practice or other fa- like talent or just whatever they deem is the reason Emory can go start recruiting or recruiting himself and putting himself out there, right? So I think that's where the end season thing comes into play. And he's not going to go to Florida because Dan Mullen says recruiting season is after the regular season. Um, so he's definitely not going to – Dan Mullen's not calling anytime soon based on that press conference. Um, but as far as end season stuff, yeah, it's tough because maybe you want the guy to compete a little bit more, but I don't think it's that simple. Um, he obviously wasn't going to get the time that he wanted or the time that the coaches were willing to give him, right? Um, so I think it's just with the the transfers, it's the guys, there's just, there's not a fit here. Um, I mean, look at Kenneth Walker, right? He played at Wake Forest the last two years. Wake Forest is eight and zero for the first time in program history without him. And now he's a Heisman, one of the Heisman favorites over at Michigan state who's ranked higher than Wake Forest. You know, it's just like guys are leaving. It's just college football, um it's the way it is I, there hasn't really been any huge transfers it's not like josh downs is transferring if josh downs transferred then we're talking about a culture issue right because josh downs is getting more targets than anyone in the country and things like that so if that's the case then we can talk culture issue but until something like that happens which i don't anticipate it happening at all um then it's just really the state of college football as a whole is the way i look at it I was trying to read some of the comments on the board as well as comments in the chat. Did you chat. like my Florida dig? I had to take a dig at Dan Mullen. That was a that was a perfect Dan Mullen comment on recruiting. Um, given the situation he's in, it was perfect. And well even timed. watching watching the way he said it is worse than reading the quote. Right, he was so dismissive. It's like next question. It was like uh, I'm just gonna watch the film. Uh, yeah. That's a uh, so w- talking about walk or uh, running back for Wake Forest now Michigan State. How cool is it that, like you mentioned, the, he leaves a team that's eight and zero to go to a team that's also undefeated. I mean, he's played for two top ten teams in the past two seasons. Not a bad deal. I mean, and uh, Dave Clawson, he coached Kenneth Walker last year, who is now a Heisman candidate. And Sam Hartman's knocking on the door of being a, a serious contender. If they get a few more wins here late, he's going to be in the conversation. You could make the argument if Kenneth Walker, Walker stays, it might not be this great for what Kenneth Walker or Wake Forest. You know, And I think that's kind of what people quite don't understand. It's like, man, if Kenneth Walker had just stuck would, with – Would they be better? Would they be better than eight? No. I mean, well, not necessarily. Not I don't I, exactly. They might be. They could be to the point where it's not beneficial for him to be here, right? Because he's not going to get the carries that he wants, and they're going to try to give him the ball. It's just maybe he didn't fit the system, you know. Like you don't. We don't know the conversations that they had behind doors. Just like we don't know the conversations that Max having with these players, right? It's not like if we could sit in there, then we could give a lot more insight. It's just like you don't. And obviously, they might be better, but they might not, right? And they're in a situation where neither of them 
Wake Forest, North Kenneth Walker are going to want to change it. And maybe going forward, Emory Simmons and UNC are going to be in situations where neither of them want to change it either. You know, that's just kind of how I look at the transfer thing. We can't change. It's not like Emory Simmons is going to come back. It's not like Chaffee Brown is going to come back to Carolina. You know, maybe it's better. It probably will be better for everybody. And this is a off on a tangent, so I apologize. But I take pride in the offseason and really kind of digging into the team and the, the ACC and, and figuring out you know, where North Carolina could get better, where they're going to suffer from. And sitting down and watching the Michigan State Michigan game Great on game, Saturday, Walker was a beast. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the quarterback after the game was like, there's three plays that you know, I didn't know we're going to pick up yards and he scores touchdowns on. He was phenomenal. And so you start watching that, like, well, this guy has completely changed the dynamic of this offense. And it makes me think back to last year. And we knew Javante and Michael Carter were good. But, you know, I, I can say for myself, I didn't realize they were as impactful as they actually were. You can just see what they're doing on the pro level to see yep. how good they were. And, and, and what I think is becoming abundantly clear is the leadership that a guy like Michael Carter provided. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So undervalued. I mean, I know. I mean, you could take away all he did on the field at Carolina. His leadership for a team like this one this season would be worth its weight in gold. Sure. Uh, I mean, it, I think if he's on this team, amazing. he makes the receivers better. Like it's not it makes just, the, the entire team is better if a guy like Michael Carter is on this. We're not having these four and four discussions and people telling us that the coaches don't owe anybody an explanation for anything or, or anything like that. But you know, Rail, what you want to say about football? Rail, I'm sorry, your man Emory Simmons is no longer in Carolina Blue. What is up with South of you, man? Come on. We had Kendrea's guy come to UNC. He had a decent career. You know, he was yeah, I did, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Where is John Hanna? Shrell, where is John Hanna now? Uh, he had to have graduated, right? He started off at South Carolina and well, he's like he 40 now, I think. Yeah, yeah, I was saying he can't be so playing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's back in Criminal County doing something. He was an absolute freak because uh, you know my tie to Southview. He was a uh, ridiculous, but I knew as soon as. As soon as he went to the LSU Alabama game, he would never he would never make his way to Chapel Hill, and it's probably for the best. But anyway, let's take a break. Uh, I think we've done the football thing enough. Let's take a break. Let's talk about uh, basketball, but we're going to do it after I talk about Johnny T-shirt. And I'm going to let Sherelle do the Johnny T-shirt read. I know you love me for it, but give it to me, Rail. You're the Johnny. You're the unofficial Johnny T-shirt sponsor uh, reader on Twitter. So do it right here. <laughs> uh yeah johnny t-shirt is the place that uh carolina fans need to go when they're in chapel hill so actually funny story i was in johnny t-shirt a couple weeks ago during one of the carolina home games come to find out the owner is from cumberland county she's a a 910 resident as well so that was pretty cool and her uh, father was actually my elementary school principal so johnny t-shirt brings people together um it's a place to go for the best carolina gear nike jordan is there any other Carolina gear besides Nike or Jordan? I don't think so. If there is, it's not important. So you can go there. Uh, Inside Carolina subscribers get 10% off their everyday order. You can find that code on the premium message board. So support the people who support us. Johnny T-shirt, uh, johnnytshirt.com. That's why I pass it off. Johnny T-shirt appreciates your service, Sherelle. I will try to check in with them on Saturday when I'm in town for the weight game. Um, but you're right. Best place uh, to get gear in Chapel Hill. Let's let the national guys pay the bills on the audio version. We'll be right back with On the Beat Live. Greg, Gregory, and now Sherelle. All right, boys. On the Beat Live. Switching channels, switching gears, switching tracks. Sherelle McMillan is here for a reason, a relevant reason. We're going to talk a little basketball. And I'm trying to call up the questions, Gregory, but I can't find them. Let's start off with a bang. I see him right here. I got him in front of me. First question for everybody, and I'm going to start with Sherelle. Even though it's an exhibition game on Friday night, Sherelle, what are you looking for specifically from Hubert Davis's first time he's trotting out his team against an opponent not wearing Carolina jerseys? Yeah, specifically is not anything specific, to be honest. And I hate to answer the question that way, but – just everything from his demeanor on the sideline to how much his assistant coaches are, you know, talking to to guys on the court and talking to him um, to the rotations, to who starts to style of play. You know, we've seen the offensively, we've seen the 
one in, four out for a few minutes at, at late night, but not against, you know, competition that wasn't wearing Carolina jerseys, as you said. So that, um, this switching defensive philosophy that seems to be um, coming from the Smith Center, I want to see that. So really just just everything. It's so fresh and so new. You know, I, I was still a student the last time UNC had a new coach, which is a long time ago. And um, back then, the excitement was palpable just because Roy Williams was Roy Williams. And it's a little different with Hubert Davis, but I still think um, fans just want to see it. And that's the biggest thing is just just seeing what it looks like against somebody else. And from there, we can start to glean things. Um, but, you know, even then, it's just one exhibition game. So I hate to cop out, but I'm just looking forward to seeing everything um, about a Hubert Davis run operation. Yeah, and I say I should have said publicly see them. We know they had a secret scrimmage against Florida that went um, pretty good. If you just watch the highlight clips, Gregory, give me something, um, one or two things you want to see Friday night. I want to see how often Caleb Love and R.J. Davis are on the floor together. I know we heard um, that they might have been together on the starting lineup against the against Florida in the scrimmage. I'm just curious to see how Hubert Davis uses those guys together. And then I also want to see the rotations. I guess it's rotations for me. I want to see that rotation, um, I guess, between Caleb, RJ, and then Kerwin, see how often they're out there together, whether it's Caleb and Kerwin, Caleb and RJ, RJ and Kerwin, all three. I want to see how that plays out. And then I want to see how Manic, Garcia, and McCoy play out. Because we know Baycott's going to be the starting five. We know he's going to rotate with Manic and Garcia, kind of. I just want to kind of see where McCoy fits into all of that. Um, so I'm really just looking at how David or how Hu- I guess Davis, yeah, how Hubert Davis uses those guys. Greg, your thoughts just overall, and a lot of people have already asked about Ant Harris, Anthony Harris. What will he be his role? That's going to be an interesting, to wa- interesting one to watch because there are a lot of bodies there um, that could that could be ahead of him. Right, and that's I think Gregory's right with the, the rotation stuff, and not that we're going to learn a whole lot on Friday. Um, but we're going to learn a whole lot in a couple weeks. And so while this is going to be an easy entry into Hubert Davis's coaching career, Not the for first long. couple weeks, right? I mean, he's got uh, Friday doesn't count anyway, but it's an easy win. And really the first three games of the year are easy wins. I know they go to Charleston, but Charleston was a mess last year. Only returned two starters, got a new coach. Um, so all that's going to be easy. And we'll really get to see what Hubert's about in Connecticut, which is going to be fascinating to watch. (laughs) But for for now, it really is the rotation part of it. And how does he want to play these guys together? And I think Ant Harris is is one of those guys, and Leaky Leaky Black's the same way to me. Like, we know what these guys bring to the table. Are they your top-level number one options? No, they're not. But each of them bring unique things. Leaky's a, a veteran leader. Um, I thought end of last year he played pretty well, brought a lot of different things to the table. We know what kind of energy boost Ant can be. So what does that earn them in this new approach to Carolina basketball where there's such an emphasis on outside shooting because that's not really something any of those guys can do. Um, And as you mentioned, when you start talking about Caleb and RJ playing together a lot, Kerwin's there in the mix, Justin McCoy is somebody that they really like. Um, I, I am. I'm very interested to see how the minutes break down after these first couple games starting on Friday night. Uh, Garcia or Manic at the four opposite Baycott, Sherelle. And I don't think it matters ultimately, but some people like to start. Some people don't mind coming off the bench, chemistry, all that stuff. So who's there? Yeah, at I'm least early push, in the season. I, I'm going to push this one. Um, but, it, you know, if it was Roy Williams, I probably could tell you. But, you know, we just don't know what Hero Davis is going to do. We think we've studied, we've uh, gleaned, we've listened, we've dissected words. But until you show up on the court and you actually see it, it it's still a surprise. So, um, you know, at first I was like, in my mind, as I'm rash, you know, rationalizing things, it's like, oh, well, Brady Manick is a perfect offensive complement to Armando Baycott. You know, he can flash out to the corner, hit threes. He's, he's a decent rebounder. You know, he's a good offensive player. You know, maybe on defense, you, you give up a little bit, but he's got that going for him. So I was like, okay, Manic. And then 
you listen to Hubert Davis and he talks about Garcia's versatility defensively about how good of a shooter Garcia is and how he can guard one through five and they want to switch screens. So he has no problem with Garcia as a four or five, you know, you know, uh, checking a point guard for a few seconds on the perimeter. It's like, well, okay, well, maybe since Garcia has that defensive upside that Hubert is talking about, then he's the better fit beside uh, Baycott. You know, I think that is one of the, you know, you talked about storylines. I guess I didn't mention this one, but how does Hubert Davis handle playing time? Because he's got a lot of good players or a lot of talented players and a lot of guys who are expecting to play minutes. They don't expect to come in and not get a lot of minutes. So balancing that as a first year head coach is going to be um, big for him. And that, I mean, honestly, that might be his biggest challenge. Um, Even getting used to playing in the ACC, getting used to, you know, going into Cameron as a head coach and making decisions. I think, figuring out the the eight or nine guys you kind of want to ride with is, is going to be huge for him if he wants to do that maybe he wants to play 12 guys every night we just we just don't know yet yeah and look it's rails made this point without actually saying it in the first two answers that he's given and he did kind of say it in the first one we have to deconstruct this this narrative that we have in our heads of of how a carolina basketball coach is going to handle things we know what Roy Williams has done for 17 years, right? He's going to play a lot of guys early and let the roster and the rotation figure itself out by the time you get into January and February. He's going to lean on veterans early. It's going to drive people nuts because that's what he does. He values leadership. He's going to play a man-to-man defense. He's going to set a starting lineup. He's going to stick with it unless something goes way wrong, right? Um, there's seven seconds left in the game and the, the ball comes off the rim. He wants his guys to go. We don't know any of that with Hubert Davis. We have no clue. And so I really encourage everybody, fan-wise, and media members as well, like really take the time and don't have assumptions because we just don't know. And so, as Rail said, watching how he interacts on the bench, watching how he handles things when a situation goes wrong. You know, Does he call a timeout when the opponent goes on a 12-0 run? We know what Roy Williams did. Does Hubert call a timeout to settle his team down? All these things we have to learn, and it's going to be a process, and we'll get a little bit of that on Friday, but it's going to take weeks and weeks, and it's going to take some very hard, difficult games. It's going to take some losses to really kind of get an idea of what Hubert Davis is about. And I I think that's fascinating. We haven't had that in a long time. Uh, I haven't had that in my time covering North Carolina. And so it's completely different, and I I, I think – there's a lot of opportunity for some fun times. Maybe some news, which is part of it. This should be a very interesting uh, next yeah, couple I don't, weeks. I don't think even when Roy – I mean, when Roy came to Carolina that long ago, you still knew how he right. was going to do things. Because he, he had, had been a head coach previously. Right. Yeah. And, and so the question – let's knock one question <laughs> off the board, I think. And, Gregory, you put it up here, so I'll let you do it. Twelve guys – He's got 12 talented guys on the team. There's no way they can play 12 deep. Not, I mean, maybe you can against Loyola and Charleston and whoever else, Brown early. But, Gregory, they can't possibly run 12 guys on the court every night as this season gets into December, can they? Not if you want to give someone like Armando 30 minutes a game or even 28 minutes a game, you know? Like, if you want to give your best players – a lot of minutes than now. And he might not want to give Armando 28 minutes. Um, he might get that early and it might spread out. We'll see, but no, you can't. I mean, DeMarco Dunn's not going to see that many minutes. Puff Johnson's not going to see that many minutes. Um, Anthony Harris might not see that many minutes. We're already down to nine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to see how many minutes a guy like Dontre Styles gets, especially because, I mean, we, we know, we see the raw athleticism. We saw it in the scrimmage at late night. Um, it's just how unrefined is that? He's not necessarily a guy that during recruiting that we were like, oh, yeah, he's going to come in and start right away or anything like that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. but So I'm curious to see kind of how someone like that fits into the rotation. Um, and I could be completely wrong here. I mean, I was wrong about a lot of things with football, right? Um, but, no, I don't. I mean, just – Watching college basketball, I don't think anyone here could say that 12 guys is a recipe for success in a Shrill. rotation. Absolutely. Uh, not Maybe for Loyola Marymount back in the day. I don't even know if Gregory even knows who I reference. Probably no, not. He doesn't. No chance. Uh, <laughs> Sherelle, 
people ask about Puff all the time. So let me give you three guys and, and let me get your take on all three. Puff, uh, DeMarco Dunn, since Gregory mentioned him. I'll go Anthony Harris. And then finally, I'll give you a fourth, Dontrez Styles. So the give four guys I just talked about? The four guys you talked about. <laughs> who, who out of that group do you think is more um, likely to – contribute more than spot minutes for this team um so you have to throw puff out just right now because we don't know his health situation um you know i think he can really be a good player I, i've said i, I think he's kind of like under a roy williams offense he's kind of a perfect traditional small forward you know from the sensibilities that roy williams had and the wings who succeeded under him but obviously it's it's a new coach and he's not healthy so i could think you can throw him out for now um, if he gets healthy, then we can change the conversation. Um, I think Dunn is just – he's going to have too many experienced guys in front of him. Not to say that he's not going to be a good player before he leaves UNC or even next year or even have good minutes this year. But I think there's just too many guys in front of him who are more ready to contribute right now. And uh, Caleb and RJ and, and Kerwin Walton. Uh, and then the other person I want to talk about, Anthony Harris, um, because he does a lot of – good things um he does a lot of solid things and we've talked about in these preseason podcasts um how there's only one ball you know you can't three people can't shoot at once so you have to have people willing to do other things to help the team win and uh glue guy has gotten a negative connotation throughout the years but it's really important theo pinson was like you know super glue guy he was kind of uh, uh the wolverine of glue guys so to speak um and i think they need something like that, whether it's Leaky, whether it's uh, Don Trez, or whether it's Anthony Harris. They need someone to focus on defense, someone to focus on just bothering opponents um, with their size, with their length, with their quickness. Uh, come off the bench, make solid plays. That's what um, the team, I think, really needs more than anything right now, just looking at how the roster has been built. Um, so I, I think Harris and Styles both have an opportunity to earn significant minutes, not just mop up minutes. And it's just a matter of which one does it. Maybe they both do it and maybe they go 10 deep. Um, we don't know. But I, I think of, of those four, those two, Harris and Styles, I think have the best opportunity. Greg, you mentioned, you know, the uniqueness and the, I guess, the fun aspect of covering Hubert Davis this year and really Carolina for the next couple of years. But from a, for, from a player standpoint, this is a good time to be on Carolina basketball team, right? You get basically, and I legitimately believe it's a clean slate from Hubert Davis. I could be wrong, but it just feels that way. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think, I think Hubert knows that, Hubert knows if some of these kids have busted their butts in recent years. And I think that's probably the only carryover is that he actually understands who's worked hard and who's not. But beyond that, I, I agree that it's a clean slate. And you're right. Um, Roy was stubborn. He'd be the first to tell you. And as, we, as we've as we talked about ad nauseum over the years, I mean, he, he trended towards the, the veterans and the senior guys because he thought he could trust them. And it, it ticked a lot of people off, but that was that was Roy. We don't know how Hubert approaches those things. Um, but the, the fact that this is his first year, anybody that can help him is going to be able to. And so you just have to contribute and you have to be able to find out where you can play. And I think the other component of it is uh, he, he's kind of referenced the positionless basketball idea. And when you go to a, a four out, one in approach, you, you kind of deal with that. Um, but you know, if a guy can play the one, a guy can play the four like a leaky black, that's going to help you because there's going to be certain spots where there's, there's congestion. And then there's going to be other spots like at the five, there's really not any congestion at all. And so however you can make yourself available and you can prove your versatility and flexibility, that's how you earn playing time. Gregory is a uh, McCoy. I'll ask this because I genuinely do not know the answer is McCoy or McCoy and leaky black just different versions of the same player. Yes. Why? I think Leaky's a little quicker. I think McCoy is a little more physical and stronger and a more at the rim type player. And that's not saying Leaky's more of a shooter because we've seen his ability his shooting abilities and I think they might be similar to McCoy. I think Leaky has more 
attempts and has shown more opportunities to shoot, but whether or not the abilities are different, it remains to be seen just because McCoy really didn't get a lot of playing time at Virginia, but in the opportunities he did, he wasn't really asked to be a shooter, and that's, I think, played into the fact the why he transferred. Um, but just seeing small minutes, I mean, McCoy's innateness to get to the rim when he needs to be off the ball as far as attacking and offensive rebounding is definitely in line with what we've seen at Carolina under Roy Williams. And then his just his defensive mind seems to be a lot further along than Leakey's as far as where he needs to be, when he needs to be, not necessarily one-on-one defense because we've seen Leakey be a good on-ball one-on-one defender. Um, but I do think, yes, they kind of will play a similar a, – a, a similar role in this team, but they are different versions of that role to answer your question. That's a good way to put it. I hadn't really thought of it like that. Um, but just based on the, what I've seen out of McCoy versus Leakey the last three years, um, yeah, they're definitely definitely different as far – and you can see that in their body type, right? Um, McCoy wants to be more physical than maybe Leakey does, whether maybe Leakey should be more physical, but he hasn't been. I think that is up for debate, but yeah, to answer your question. Sure, I'd love your opinion on that because, you know, I don't. Does you mentioned the glue guy earlier? Does I think they both could fit that role? Um, I mean, I don't think there's a need for more than one of those guys. I don't know. What's your take there? Um, yeah, they both can fill that role. Um, I think buy-in is required to fill that role, and that is Hubert Davis's job to to get them to do what he wants them to do. And if if that's the thing, then um we'll we'll see what happens i I think um as far as comparing the two to me they're they're not that similar um just because mccoy has always been kind of a hybrid forward he's been that since you know the first time we watched him three and a half four years ago whereas leaky was a point guard for most of his high school career and played some you know extensively at unc before kind of making the full-time move to uh the wing slash small forward last year and I think one thing that's hurt, in my opinion, one thing that's hurt his development, and I don't think it's anybody's fault, um, when you have someone his size, with his athleticism, with his skill, you kind of want that person to fill in gaps in the roster. And that's what they have used him for the last couple of years. So, you know, when Cole Anthony got hurt a couple of years ago, there was Leakey, you know, playing point guard and, and doing it well to some degree. There were games where he struggled, but um, doing it, you know, you know, competently. And then, you know, last year he was the starting three and there were times when he played really well and there were times when he, when he didn't. But I think if there had been that focus from day one on one position, maybe the conversation is different on Leakey. Um, maybe that's revisionist. I don't know, but that, that's something I think about a lot. Um, but as far as those two, yeah, I definitely think McCoy is much more of a, of a three, four. And I think, I think of Leakey as more of a backcourt player who just happens to have the size of a three, four, um, even mentality wise, Leakey has more of a, a guard mentality. Whereas McCoy to Gregory's point has the mentality more of a, of a, of a traditional forward. And I think McCoy is going to start. So I've already said that. So hold that. We'll have our starting lineup predictions, but Sherelle, you mentioned in the slack that you wanted to ask these guys some, some questions and I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. So one thing I try to do every year is look for a few numbers, stats, you know, records that could either be in jeopardy or I think are, are um, you know, guys on the team have a chance to, to get close to. So I, I did a little bit last year. I thought Dayron Sharp had a chance to get close to that Brandon Wright field goal percentage record, which he, he didn't come close, but Armando Baycott did. Um, and then two years before that was Kobe White and Cole Anthony both, you know, going after. Um, not the points per game by a freshman, but the total points by a freshman, the record is held by Joe Forte. I think Cole would have got it if he stayed healthy. Kobe even came close as it was, um, but didn't get it. So here's a couple that I wanted to ask you. I'm going to give you like three seconds. So um, how many players, (laughs) how many players in the last 30 years who have attempted 50 or more threes in a season in the ACC have made 50%? Last all right. Last thirty years, at least fifty threes. At least fifty threes. Fifty percent. Fifty percent of in the yeah. ACC. In the ACC. How many would you guess? Zero. It's more than zero. It's more than two. It's, it's less than ten. My, I'm feeling seven. 
It's six. Oh, wow. So six, That's crazy. So six times in the last 30 years. And I asked that because I think Kerwin Walton can do it. Um, and I just want to get y'all's opinion on that because he was at 42% as the only yeah. legitimate shooter on a team who had post guys everywhere, yeah. who had not great spacing. And you knew all you got to do is go, you know, crowd up on 24 and they have no perimeter game. There were and some he four shot shots there with their. Yeah. yeah. And he shot 42% even with that. So I want to get your, y'all's thought on that. Yeah, just wow. with the way the, the offense is going to be designed, you would think that he's going to get a lot more open looks. And as good of a shooter as he is, that should equate to more makes. So I, I agree with you. I, I think the fact that he did as well as he did last year uh, was surprising and impressive. And so, yeah, I'm, if anybody's going to do it in recent North Carolina basketball history, it's going to be Corwin Walton. Was it 50 makes or 50 attempts? He attempts. Okay, so, so he had 138 last year. Do you think he'll reach that number or no, since there'll be other shooters? I, I don't think he'll have as high a number of attempts, but I, I think he'll be just be more efficient because there'll be wide open looks. And, you know, he doesn't miss wide open looks very often. Right. That's oh, what I was going that's to ask. A fun, many, I love you. How bro. many? How many? Uh, <laughs> y'all get a room. How many? Um, how many attempts does he get? How many attempts? Let me ask you an over or under rail. How many three pointers attempted by this team this year without looking at the stats? Over or under five hundred. I'm. Try- I was just looking at the stat book today. Uh, I was trying to think of what the record was. I just saw it. It was. Um, it actually was the um the bad season, <laughs> the fourteen to nineteen season. I think uh, they said the record for most threes attempted the year before was the second highest. I, I'm pretty sure y'all can check me on that. Um, I'll 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 go under. And I say that because I think we've gotten – because everybody's going to have the opportunity to shoot threes, I think we as a uh, consuming media fans um, have just assumed, oh, they're just going to jack a whole bunch of threes. And I don't know that to be the case. I think from – if you listen to Hebert Davis, he's talked about movement and spacing um, and, and you know making sure the ball swings back and forth. And that always doesn't mean threes. I mean, if there's right. a driving lane – like he's going to want his guys to drive and, and get an easy basket, you know, even though threes, um, you know, I, I know the math with threes and, and twos and all that stuff, but if you can get a layup, you can get a layup, you know what I'm saying? So I, I think um, maybe we've gone too far in expecting a three point barrage this, this season. Don't get me wrong. They're going to shoot a lot of threes, but I, I don't know that they will break any of those records. It, it might be close, but I think there's going to be more of an emphasis on movement and whatever happens from the movement and the spacing um, they're fine with. It, it, I think the change is they're fine with a three from the corner as opposed to a layup, even though they, they weighed them the same. Whereas Roy Williams weighted the layup more than the three pointer. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Who are the six that did it? Sherelle. And, and people oh, I, 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 I didn't write them down. Um, nobody. <laughs> You're gonna drive the chat crazy. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll put something on the message board tonight. Um, I'm trying to even remember the names. They were some obscure guys. Um, no, so Finis Dimbo. So were you no. shocked that Curran Wallen wasn't preseason All ACC based on you bringing that up? Not shocked. I mean, people got to realize there's a lot of teams in the conference now. And we kind of live in a North Carolina bubble. So the importance of Carbon Walton, we see maybe more than someone, you know, from Florida voting or for someone from New York voting. Um, So not surprised. I I do think his importance on the team has been undervalued significantly um, in the conversation nationally in the lead up to the season. Greg, did you have a ballot? Uh, I did not vote this year. Yeah, I didn't either. Isn't it? I mean, you got 15 teams, three all ACC preseason teams, one guy from each team. You could do that way. I mean, no way Kerwin gets on that based on just those numbers, to your point, Rail, with all the teams they've got in the league, not with all the writers from out of state. But right. right. Give us give us another, uh, another question. All right. So let's see. Um, when is the last time – excuse me. When's the last time UNC had a lead guard – who had a double double with points and assists? It's a trick question because there's somebody who's done it since the lead guard, but specifically lead guard. Leaky's has done he, it since the lead guard, hasn't he? No, he had nine. He didn't get ten. Oh. Okay, well, give me the question again. It wasn't the season average, right? No, just in a single game, a lead guard 
had a double double with points and assists. By lead, you mean point guard? Yeah. Yes. Correct. We don't use that term anymore, Tommy. It is offensive <laughs> to people who like to score. So, so we it wasn't. So it wasn't Kendall. Cole, Cole had to have done it, right? Cole didn't do it. So it wasn't Kendall. Oh, You're well, making it sound like it was further, further there's along. There's been someone than since. There's been one person. There's. It's happened since Kendall. Larry Drew. Nate. So, no, he's Joel, gone. so Joe Barry did it, but it was December of 2015. Really? So to contextualize, the point guard, lead guard position in North Carolina has not had a double-double with point and assists Nate in Britt. six years. And, Rel, what was our conversations was it early in Joel's career about what the analytics said about him? Do you remember those conversations? Oh, about him as a shooting guard? Right. Yeah. yeah. He, was a, he was essentially a shooting guard playing point Right, ball. right. Right. Wait, did I miss so, the answer? Was it Joel? It's, it's yeah, Joel Barry. It's Joel Barry. Oh, December, okay. December of 2015. Um, Theo Pinson, I, like I said, it's a trick question. Theo Pinson had the last one. Okay, so that's where I was thinking leaky. In, Theo. in 2018. So the point of that is, um, and then, you know, I tested it with Ben. And he was like, well, you need to control whether or not basketball has kind of changed. And we looked at stats and it's just, it's that, you know, <laughs> North Carolina's league guards haven't been distributors, you know, the last six or seven years. And that's not a bad thing, but it is different than what UNC is used to, really going back to Ken- Kendall Marshall, some of the fantastic point guards they had in the 2000s. And my point in bringing that stat forward is, one, a question for you all. Um, do you think that that'll happen this year where or Caleb Love or, or RJ Davis will have a you know 10-point, 10 10-assist 10 game? And then I ask that because I feel like it'll be easier to do now with the emphasis on movement and the emphasis on spacing and the emphasis on driving and kick and pick and roll and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on that. I don't think so. I mean, I don't maybe either. one, but I just don't see Caleb Love or RJ, for that matter, a guy that's going to get consistently close to 10 assists. Maybe but we're just talking Ken- one game, just one yeah. game. I know. I'm, I'm trying. I If it's going to be somebody, so. it's going to be RJ. And. Okay. I, I mean, if Kendall Marshall played on this team, he'd probably average ten. There's just, there's just going to be less post feeding, which is kind of where if you were going to do it, I think you were going to get it last year. Like I th- or like I, I, I think if you're going to do that, you're going to get it by just feeding the post. But then like, then again, you might get it this year because I know Hubert Davis is emphasizing a when the big men get the ball down low, go up with it quicker. So like, may I don't. I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think I don't think it would be easier this year. I disagree with you on that. My my thought is, if if you listen to Hubert, they, they talked about pick and roll. They talked about moving and spacing, as we mentioned several times. On the pick and roll, if you look at how the NBA operates, and I guess a lot of this is going to have to do with the scorebook, but you know, pick and roll, the big pops and shoots. That's the easy pass. That's an assist. Um, so that's one area that I think you know will, will give UNC's guards, you know a couple more opportunities to get assists than they had before. And then we're talking about driving and dishing. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of that because there was no one to dish to other than Kerwin, True. who was consistently <laughs> making a shot on the outside this year. Like we talked about, you know, Brady's going to be over in that corner, the shortest three point shot in the game. And he's a great shooter for his career. So he's going to be over in that corner. You know, there'll be times when he's in one corner, Kerwin Walton's in the other, you know, Caleb's on the wing. And, you know, from, what we've seen, it seems like you would expect some natural growth in Caleb's shooting, and RJ has shown some some growth in shooting. Um, so I, I think there's a chance just because of that. I, I feel like more open space, the ball is going to be swinging back and forth, and, and maybe they'll have a shot at it. So, um, And the reason, again, I'm bringing this up because I think it's a key. I think the point guards have to be better distributors and, of course, limit their turnovers. Um, are they going to have the ball in their hands as as like as often, though? Because like Carolina's when, when, always going to have the ball in the lead guard hand, right? When like when Cole Anthony was here as the point guard, yes, he wasn't a distributor first type guy, but he had the ball in his hands more than anybody. So like, I don't see Caleb or RJ having the ball as much to get to that ten assist number. Is kind of how I'm viewing it. I think that's fair, um, but then again, they want to play fast, you know. Yeah. So you're going to have more possessions. You're going to have more opportunities. Um, so just something I was thinking about, um, the next one. So I looked at defensive adjusted efficiency for, so for those who don't know, that's basically how many points you give up, um, per hundred possessions. Right. So, uh, last year's, the last year's UNC team, do you think that was, you know, 
one of the 10 best, you know, since 1997, which is the date when Ken Palm's data goes back to. Would you say that's, you know, one of the 10 best, five best, 15 best? Where, where would you rank last year's team or just from the eye test? Where would you think they were? Five best. Greg, I'll, I'm out of this one. <laughs> um, I mean, last year was they were good, uh, incredibly good defensive efficiency wise because of rebounding. That skews the numbers dramatically. So I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that's. I'd be shocked if there's five other better seasons than last year. I'm not sure if in that stat yeah. specifically. And I would say they're just outside top five. It's number six. Oh, okay, number six. <laughs> so. So I, they were I bring 27th that out. in the country last year in that state. Yeah, they were right. And I think people, because of how the season ended with Wisconsin, that skews how people looked at the entire season. And there were some games where guys went off, like the Marquette game was just terrible. They, they just weren't ready to play that day. Um, but overall, you know, they were a, a, a solid defensive team. And so, yes, the scheme is changing a little bit and there are some, some new players, but I think the skill sets aren't that dissimilar. So, if they were that decent on defense last year, you would expect that just, you know, kind of reversion to the mean on offense would make them, you know, a much better team. Like I, that's really, you can have some slippage on defense. Say they go from 24 to 40 or whatever, but they were so atrocious and inefficient offensively. If they bring that up to a more manageable number, it, it, in my mind, the numbers even out and it seems like they would be a, a more complete team. Obviously coaching change there. Um, but that was just my thought. Go ahead, Greg. No, I'm, I'm sensing this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rel. I think you have some uh, some simmering optimism about how this <laughs> season plays out. Is that oh, he's excited. No, I mean, I, like I said, I've, I've said this, and I think, I mean, how many more teams in the country, one through 12? Are there four teams, five teams, who we could say have a McDonald's all American two McDonald's All-American guards, who you know could be in the starting lineup? A guy coming back who uh, was one of the mo- was known as basically the best shooter in the 2020 class. Um, a McDonald's All American coming back at center, a transfer incoming McDonald's All American in the post, and a guy who started four years at Oklahoma um, and has like 200 and some career threes. I mean, there's not many teams that can say they have that kind of talent. And I think the Hubert factor, because this is his first year, is kind of clouding how people view UNC because they, they just don't know where to put them. But if I put that profile, if I did like a blind resume and gave the team another name and just repeated that back to you, I think people would be like, oh, that's a that's a top 10 team. Um, so I, I, in my mind, all we need to see is how Hubert Davis coaches and um, – you know, if, if he does it competently like we all expect and, and like he's kind of shown in recruiting and how he's built the program over the last few months, I think they can have a really good season. I mean, they, they are a talented team, and I think that's getting overlooked. Someone said like Rell's like pulling it. at Tommy, and he's got him 31-0. No, not, no. A, not, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It's, it's the hope. It's the hope. <laughs> I'm with I'm, you. I'm yeah. to tell y'all, it's not the despair, it's the hope. People on you. Twitter love to do the Team A, Team B, the blind resume thing, and I think they would take that resume that you just gave without – yeah, 100%. The um, I look at it differently. I think I think Hubert's getting a, a Carolina bump, and that's why expectations are higher than I probably thought they would be. I mean, they're 19th in the preseason. Poll. Right. They're second in the they're the second highest ACC team in the preseason poll. Correct. Um, I think I think in in college basketball more than pretty much any other sport, coaching matters. Has he done all the right things to date, uh, recruiting wise? Yes. Um, he's put together some pieces. We have to see if he can actually put them together though. If they if it works chemistry wise. I think there's a lot of questions about this lineup. I mean, Caleb Love has to take a significant step forward. Huge. Because, I mean, the the data on him last year was not good. It was, it, it was actually really bad. It's essentially a step no one's ever taken, basically. Correct. If you look right. at the numbers. That's a good yeah. way to put it. Um, now, I think, I think the saving grace for this team early, especially, uh, is Armando Baycott. And I, I agree with Rel that I think Corwin Walton's a little bit undervalued. 
And if he has developed the way that, that we've heard that he's really worked at in terms of being able to create off the dribble just enough to kind of give him some – make defenses have to respect him beyond the arc, that's an incredible one-two punch. Um, and then if Caleb takes steps forward and then you get some of the transfers making some plays, maybe this team can emerge. I mean, if this team gets on a roll – in Connecticut and starts winning some of these games against Purdue and Villanova and Michigan, then yeah, I'll be shocked and you know, tip the cap to Hubert because it'd been an incredible start. I just got a lot of questions about how all this is going to come together and I'm going to need to see it before I can kind of buy into it. Um, I, I do have one stat. Rail kind of makes me mad because he came with, with stats and, <laughs> and I we have a whole segment playing. called G Biggie stat of the week and Rail came know, with like so, eight. So I'm a little bit <laughs> jealous that Rail did that. Um, so I've got one that I'll, I'll send back to you. <laughs> only, only once in Roy Williams' tenure did North Carolina rank outside the top 25 in offensive rebounding percentage. Does this team this year rank inside the top 25 in offensive rebounding percentage? What was their percentage that year? What year? The year yeah, they that didn't. they were outside the top 25, what was the offensive rebounding percentage? That'll give it away, so I'm not going to tell you the well, year. <laughs> no, um, no, no, no. It was 2012-2013, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's relevant. Why, Rel? Because they played small. Right. Well, half the year they played small. Yeah. 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 So they were 77th nationally that year. And that's the year, as Rel said, that's the year that they moved. I guess it was the Duke game when, mm-hmm. when Roy moved uh, PJ into the starting lineup. If if they rank in the top twenty five this season, Baycott's averaging fifteen rebounds a game, and six or seven or eight of those are offensive rebounds. Or uh, Tommy, they're just not a very good three point shooting team, like we all think they're going to be. That that's a fair point. I mean, I came in last year and I said, you know what, they're going to be better than they were last year. The worst three point shooting year ever. Uh, you know, Caleb Love has shown comp- he's competent and R.J. Davis can shoot. We know Kerwin, can, you know, I said all that stuff and and there they were shooting it just as bad. It's not worse than they did the, the year before. So, I mean, that 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 is a fair point. I, my pushback would be that they're not freshmen anymore. And so there is typically that growth um, from from freshmen to sophomores. And then, of course, bringing in Manic and bringing in um, Garcia. Um, but, Greg, I, you know, I, I'm going to answer your question. I'm, I'm a cop out a little bit, but. I don't know because does Hubert Davis emphasize offensive rebounding the same way Roy Williams did? He said, "Oh yeah, we we, we emphasize rebounding," but does he really emphasize rebounding the way Roy Williams did? It was, right. it was you know, it was rebound, run faster, rebound, run faster with Roy Williams. You know, kind of that kind of deal. Um, so is that the same way with Hubert Davis? I don't know. Right, um, and that's the that's the thing too is everybody wants to talk about, and hopefully we'll get to talk to Hubert about this tomorrow but it's about the defensive scheme, right? And Roy only wanted to do man. Uh, and Dean mixed up his defenses. And the reason that's relevant is because Roy would get, I mean, in, what's the word? Uh, what am I looking for? Not infuriated. Is that right? Yeah, he would be yeah. infuriated if they infuriated. didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Or it's he'd late, be furious. He'd late. be infuriated. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Fury. We'll go with furious. Sorry. Um, be furious if he went to the zone for like two possessions and somebody didn't box out. Cause the reason he liked man is because everybody knew who they had. When you get into zone, it's like zone blocking in football. You kind of have to find somebody close to you and box out. And that's not as instinctive as saying, okay, well I'm, I'm guarding this guy. I've got to box him out. That's the main reason that, that Roy liked man so much. And to Rell's point, because he emphasized rebounding so much. And that was everything grew out of that. And we don't know what Hubert's stance is on that. We know we know he says they're sending a three, four, and five every time. A lot of coaches say that. <laughs> if you so, uh I mean you can emphasize rebounding. Somebody said you get what you emphasize. Um I mean you can emphasize shooting all you want, but if the guys can't shoot, then you gotta matter. rebound. You gotta rebound. What'd you go I cut you off, Rail, I'm sorry. No, I, I was I was segueing into my final stat, which I think is will could be instructive, and I'm looking for for the season. So, um, it it involves rebounding. So five players, um, they've done it a total of six times, but five players have averaged double doubles, points, rebounds at UNC since 2000. Who do you think they are? And then we'll go from there. Repeat that. 
Five players don't, have don't done look, it. Don't give me that, Tom. <laughs> Since 2000, five players have, have averaged a double-double with points and rebounds at UNC. They've done it a total of six times. So who do you think those five players are? Well, obviously, Hans Rowe. That's one? Um, five players have done it six times? Yes. Armando did it once. He did not. He did not. Garrison do it? Garrison did not do it. No, he did an ACC play in that whole season. Um, so we have to list four more people. We've got Tyler. Mm-hmm. John Zeller. Hansen. Serious recent. Hansen. Recency that's buys. two. Okay. Bryce. That's three. So no Tyler Zeller? No Tyler Zeller. I don't know. I, I Those on, are the three on, that I would have guessed. Hang on, hang on, hang um, on. Let the grown man talk down there. Where are you on the on the real screen? You're on my bottom left. So you've got three of them. You've got Tyler, you've got Bryce, and you've got John Henson. Since what year? Since 2000. Sean May. Since 2000. Sean, Sean May. May. Yeah. Is that... I'll let, I'll let so, G. Biggie get the last one. So you're missing one. The Meeks. one. You haven't you gotten the, we haven't gotten the guy that got no, it, it, it was twice. Luke May. It was Luke, Luke May, May twice. Right. Yeah. Twice. Luke May did it twice. That's right. So I asked that because – I think Armando Baycott is going to average a double-double uh, because he's going to have so much space in there. If uh, Again, not to take too much from a scrimmage game, uh, a scrimmage at late night, but the way he just grabbed boards, and uh, people just forget how huge and massive of a person he is and how much he's gotten in shape over the years. And, he slimmed down. Yeah, a, a ton. I, I just think you know he's going to have the opportunity to grab a ton of rebounds, and it's not going to be – he's not going to have Dayron Sharp vulturing him over here and Garrison Brooks you know, vulturing his rebounds over there. Like He's kind of – he's going to be the guy in the middle, and he's going to have the opportunity to, to grab a ton of rebounds. So I think he will be the sixth person on that list come the end of the season because um, I just expect that much from him. Yep, I agree. Greg, Greg you were, do, you, do you oh, – Sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. Greg, remember uh, Armando in a, at Battle for the Atlantis against Oregon? Right. Is that the dude we see this year, you think, finally? I think so. He, he was, was the best player like, on the court. That, by that far, was by far fascinating to watch up close. I mean, he absolutely dominated. He was a freshman in his, what, that third or game? fourth game? <laughs> if yeah. that, yeah. I mean, but at the end if, of if, last if, year, I mean, the way that he – People could kind of get around him and make him small on the block, you know, throughout his first two years. But the end of last year, that changed, and he was wide and he was strong and took up space. And you do that this year with the four in or four out one in approach. Good luck defending him. So yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think he can have a monster year. And stay think on about the court. The, yeah, stay, stay on, on the court. court. <laughs> Think about the confidence he's going to have. You know, it's, it's nothing against those guys, but he's with Garrison, you know, as a freshman. And then he's with Garrison and Dayron and Walker as a sophomore. And now, you know, Garcia's coming in, Mangan's coming in, but we know who we know who the post belongs to for UNC. Not saying he's going to exclusively play there because they do want him to do more offensively and defensively. But, um, yeah, I, th- I think he can just have a, a really big season, like, you know, 16 10 and 2 you know something like that i don't think it's far-fetched for him at all um over the season to be ahead, Gregor. i was just gonna say greg mentioned earlier the gauntlet that is taking on purdue and then either villanova or tennessee and then ucla so i just wanted to get everyone's non-conference record prediction we've got 11 non-conference games because the AC- when we get to acc play that can be a different discussion that we have a month, a month and a half from now. So I just eleven non-conference games. You've got the three big, four big ones because you're also taking on Michigan. Um, what are we? What are we? What are we feeling? What do you think, Rail? Since you're Mister Optimism. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say optimism. I just think I'm looking at it through a different <laughs> lens. That's all. Um, not optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, you have to think that um, you know they'll drop a couple. Um, especially some of those against teams who seem to be rated highly. And again, you know, North Carolina was rated highly last year and then they weren't. So some of these teams may not be as good as the number beside them. We don't know yet. And that's what we'll figure out over the next month. Um, It could be a situation where they play Purdue and Purdue is just not as good as everybody thinks they were going to be. And they'd be Purdue. Or it could be a situation where North Carolina is not nearly as good as we all thought. And they are definitely not the number 19 team. 
Um, so I, I'm just I'm interested to see those. But I, I think you can assume a split, you know, kind of in those four games, the the three top ten games, and then um, uh, the I guess Michigan's in there too. Um, it could be UCLA. four top. It could be four top yeah, ten games. It could be UCLA, Tennessee, uh, Villanova, and Michigan. That's Purdue's four, seventh. Or, and Purdue, okay. So, so Tennessee's I, I think, 18th. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would say two to three wins. If you can go three and two, and if if you happen to get that far over that stretch, um, like I think Michigan at home, I think that's one of those where the home crowd will mean a lot. Um, and and against a team like Michigan, who employs the type of offense that they've employed for so long, um, the changes that Hubert Davis has made, I think will will pay dividends in a game like that. Um, same thing if they – if. Uh, do they play Villanova or they have to beat Purdue to play So Villanova? if they beat Purdue, they play the uh-huh. winner of Villanova or Tennessee. And Which if they I lose assume... to Purdue, they play the loser of that game. Okay. I assume I assume that Villanova will win that game. So they'll have to beat Purdue to uh, play Villanova. But, um, you know, a, a team like Villanova, again, that style that they play against a Royal Williams team, that would have that would have been tough um, early in the season with senior guards and leadership and – five guys who can hit threes on the court at all times, but with this new philosophy of, you know, switching on defense and, and having, you know, bigs who are a little more versatile on the perimeter who can keep up on switches, you know, you have to think maybe they'll have a better chance. Um, so all that to say, I would expect, you know, that they, they kind of split it. Um, so like three and two through that stretch, which would put them maybe, I don't know, something like uh, eight, and eight, three. And three, eight and three, nine and two. I, I would... Yeah, I'll go eight and three. I'll go eight and three. There you go. The chat was really good. They were like, come on, Ro, give us a, <laughs> give I'm talking us about, a number. I'm, I'm talking through it. I'm talking through it. <laughs> Greg? Yeah, I agree with Rail, and I'll, I'll take it a step further just through the, the calendar year. I'll say North Carolina arrives in Boston for a noon tip on New Year's Day, which I am just stoked about with a <laughs> nine and four record. So then that includes a game against Georgia Tech. At, at Georgia Tech and then Virginia Tech. Okay. Uh, a couple of days after Christmas. So what, what is their uh, what was what your is record? Their ACC record? Nine and four, you said? Nine and four, eight and three in non conference. Same as So real. you have them losing to Virginia Tech? Georgia Tech. I don't know. One of those. Two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think Virginia Tech is going to be the better team. But, but it's a home game. Atlanta. Atlanta. That's Atlanta. Hubert Davis's ACC home opener. Hey, Atlanta is his ACC road opener. And yes. Carolina doesn't win anything in Atlanta ever. <laughs> That's right. So That's right. I have him. Really. Nine, I have him nine and two non-conference. I got eight and three. I, I'll go with eight and three. Sherelle makes five points. The one thing I do like about this team is the veteran experience because I think that matters, and I think that's what Carolina has been lacking. Um. And I think that matters in college basketball. It seems like it does these days. And I think that'll get them through on one of those big, one of those big top ten games. Um, I'd like it to be Michigan, since I'll be in the building for that. Um, and then I'd like to see them play Villanova, one way or another as well. Rail, you make valid points. Is that Hubert's style will be more ben? presumed Hubert style will be more beneficial against the new era or the new wave college basketball. You know what I'm talking about. And so that'll be interesting to see it play out. Let's get to the, uh, and I let down the chat. Y'all are not getting me to pick 12 and O again, and then give me hell when I pick 12 and O for selling y'all a bill of goods. It doesn't work that way anymore. Um, I ought to go three and nine or three and eight. And then I'll <laughs> reverse jinx. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, let's do. Uh, let's pick our. Um, let's pick our presumed starting lineups. Gregory, start. Um, I've changed a little bit since the last time we did this. Um, I think I'm going to go Caleb, RJ, Kerwin, Dawson, Baycott. You literally said McCoy. I know. But I forgot about RJ. I forgot about. I, I think RJ is going to be in there. Sherelle. I did change. I'm sorry. I, yeah, man, this is hard because we're we're operating with not enough information. So uh, you're asking me for inputs. I don't. I don't have. You know, I don't. I don't it's have. Why it's, it's why it's people <laughs> like me predict twelve and zero <laughs> when it's really four and four. You know what I mean? It's called so, predictions for a reason. <laughs> so what? Okay, so I'll answer it this way. What Roll Williams would do? The starting lineup for Roll Williams would be Caleb, Kerwin, Leaky. 
uh, probably Garcia and Baycott. That would be the starting lineup for Roe Williams. Yes, I, I think sir. we're all clear on that. Yep. For Hubert Davis, um, and this is trying to extrapolate everything he said and come up with something. Um, he said he wants multiple ball handlers. He has an emphasis on shooting, an emphasis on spacing, um, and then he wants guys who can guard on the perimeter. Um, he wants somebody who can stop the ball, and he wants bigs who are versatile and who can switch. So taking all of that into account, I think you go. he goes with RJ and Caleb initially. I think Kerwin slides down to the three, and this is basically the scrimmage starting lineup. Um, but I think Garcia gets the nod at the four because of that defensive versatility. Um, if him and, and, and Manic are equal um, uh, offensively, then maybe the, the defensive prowess of Garcia pushes him over the top. Um, I could go, you can flip a coin on that one. I just don't know. I'm just guessing. And then Baycott in the middle. Um, I think the more important point is they have about seven guys who I think they would feel confident starting, um, you know, at some point during the year, which I think is more than they've had in the past. And the the roster is such that it's not four guys at one position like it was last year. Um, I think it's more spread out. So I think they probably feel good about, you know, probably two wings. They probably feel good about two to three guards and they feel good about you know, three bigs. So um, it's more of a complete roster than they've had where one year they've had a bunch of bigs and no guards. The next year they have a bunch of guards and no bigs. This year it seems more complete. The only guarantee that no doubters are Love and Baycott. Yes. Everywhere in between. Kerwin, I think Kerwin's a guarantee. I think the two and the – I think the two and the – or I guess whether Kerwin's the two or the three is the question and then whoever the four is going to be I think are the questions. What you got, yeah. Greg? Well, so here's my question. I know I know Hubert has talked about liking the idea of playing two point guards together. That's something that Roy really stressed after 2012. The way that season ended with Stillman having to carry the load uh, against Kansas and, and Ohio. Um, I don't know if they have the depth at point guard to be able to do that in terms of primary rotation, uh, and because of that. I don't know. Uh, I just think RJ is probably going to have to come off the bench. And uh, again, you know, everything Rail said is legitimate. Uh, Gregory as well. We don't know enough details right now, but but I would say uh, I would say Love for sure. I, I think Kerwin's probably at the two. Um, you know, I, I just have a, a Rory Williams devil on my ear saying Linky Black at the three. Uh, even though I'm, I'm more inclined to, to think that may be Justin McCoy. And then I do think the defensive concern with Manic is legitimate. Um, but I still think if you've got Justin McCoy at the three, then you can afford to have Manic at the at the four because of his outside shooting. I like and what course, you're selling. And then, of keep, course, you've got Baycott in the, in the middle. I would love McCoy at the it. three. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it's Caleb, Kerwin, McCoy – Manic and Baycott, and I think that's their best. McCoy covers up any Manic um, deficiency on defense, and I think Manic's better on offense than Garcia. I think he's got more low post fadeaway moves, and I think he can shoot it better from the outside. We'll see. I, one thing is probably certain. I don't think the starting lineup on Friday especially, but on Tuesday against Loyola is anywhere near what the starting lineup might be other than the three we've talked about on January 1st or whenever. Or November 20th in Connecticut. Yeah, so it, it'll be fun to watch. Last hey, question. Look, how, hang on. How fascinating would it be if Hubert adapted this approach of forget your starting lineup, but organize your roster to your opponent, for it to, be a, to, your opponent to make mm-hmm. it a matchup thing so that we see that. completely different starting lineups depending on who they're playing. I'm in. I'm I mean, so Virginia ready. Tech versus, you know, one of these teams is going to be a bunch of bigs. I, I think that'd be interesting. Or against like a Syracuse zone. Correct. Right. I'm um, in. That, that would be good for, for, for us watching it. That'd sure. Be great. Sure. For, for the fans. Wonderful. <laughs> for Hebrew Davis. Uh, that is a, that's, that's, that's tough. That, that would be something where, and maybe he's going to do that, but that, again, that, and, and I wanted to make one final point about this team, but that brings me back to, <clears throat> just about how much talent there is on the team and they all expect to play. I think more so than anything adjusting to 
being a head coach and all that, I really do believe that is his biggest challenge this year because I think basketball wise, I'm a big believer that talent kind of, you know, trumps everything. And so I think the talent will help push them over the top and, and, and make them a good team. It's going to be him managing that talent and getting that talent to always play hard and to buy in to maybe not as many shots as you thought, or maybe not as many minutes as you thought coming into the season. If he can get the talent to buy into that, then, then you've got, you know, something you know really good potentially brewing. And um, it's important because, I was talking with someone um, for another podcast that will be out later this week um, about the 2005 season. And I, I made a comparison and the comparison was back then, you know, they had three seniors on the team, they had a bunch of juniors. They knew going into that year, that was it. Everybody was going to leave. You know, they had one chance to do it. And so they, they felt that pressure because it had been built up over the course of two, three, four years. This team is going to have that exact same, scenario where they're probably going to lose four or five, maybe even six guys after the season to either, you know, to NBA graduation, what have you. Um, but they're not going to feel that same finality that that group felt because it hasn't been built over time. So how does Hubert Davis instill in that team, the idea that, Hey, this, this is it for this team. You know, Brady's going to graduate. Lee, he can go graduate. You have uh, at least three other guys who have NBA aspirations who are showing up on, on different draft boards and stuff who can make a decision. Um, so he has to figure out how to let them know that this is it, that this is this team's one and only opportunity to do something great. Um, and, you know, I think he's up for it, but we'll, we'll have to see over the course of the next few months. What is the number one thing that improves team chemistry? <laughs> You're going to say leadership, right? I'm gonna say winning. Winning, okay, yeah, f- fair enough. If, if, if they win, that win, I will never forget Max Owens telling me, and Max Owens was no great player, but he was part of um, Carolina basketball. And I asked him about losing his starting position. I think it was probably to Okalaja back then. I can't remember. And he said, "I do not care as long as we win." And when they started losing, that's when it went to you know what in a hand basket. So I, I agree. Chemistry is the number one thing that Hubert. Managing the team, game management. How many times have we talked about on the football podcast, game management and team management? I think that'll be Hubert Davis's number one thing this year. Who is the leader on this team? I mean, is it it clearly leaky, even though he's a quiet guy? Mm. Is Baycott a leader? Justin McCoy, can you lead being a new guy? Do you need need traditional leadership? I think it's the bigger question. I think you do. Can it, it can it it can't be from the head coach. I think well, what's the old rule? Player led teams are better than coach led teams. I, I need to see some empirical you data think, on that. You think <laughs> Hubert can fill that role though, considering he's never coached a game before? I I think so. Um, and, and maybe it's me getting caught up in what he said. Um, but you know, it seems like you know when we were when all this was happening, we always talked about the best man for the job versus the right man for the job. And for this particular moment, it seems like he is tailor-made for this particular team to kind of be, you know, the person who drags UNC, I don't want to say drags, that's that's a negative connotation, but who takes UNC into this new era. And I think for a season or two, I, I do think the head coach can be the leader of the team. Now, obviously, as time goes on, you want the players to do that themselves. Um, but I, I think this year he can do it. And um, you know, he's got Armando, he's got Caleb, you know, they're expected to be two of the better players. So you, you would think that they could provide some of that. And I do think McCoy can do it too. And the good thing for him, that uh, y'all talked about kind of a clean slate, you know, he's starting fresh just like everybody else because it's a new coach. So there, there's no reason um, if they need a, a traditional leader that he can't come in and do it. I just don't know that that's necessarily a, a 100% um, have to have to be a winning team. I just think- my personal opinion. I think in basketball, you can have the head coach be that vo- more vocal leader, but you definitely need lead by example guys, the diving on the ground to go get the ball, those type of guys where like the other players know that that guy's going to do whatever it takes, the tough nitty gritty type stuff. And I think if they have that, because they all look up to Hubert because he's, I mean, they talk about his NBA experience and that he's been where every guy on this team wants to be. So I think it's possible and then the players will develop vocals as it kind of moves on and i think right now it is caleb leaky and armando 
Now, those three aren't very vocal guys, but they can still be leaders in their own right, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I, just, I was going to say, I uh, I was able to sit in on Final Four locker rooms and watch how guys reacted to Marcus Page and to Joel Berry. Um, it's important. Uh, and granted, we're not necessarily talking about this team being that level of team. But, um, yeah, I, you know, the game has changed. And, and to Rail's point, you know, not only are we beyond maybe the, the standard positions of one, two, three, four, five, but maybe we're to a point now where it's not the, the standard model of there being one leader, there being multiple guys or, or maybe maybe coaches. But we'll, we will find out very soon, Tommy. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the, the transfer portal and the, and the going pro early and not staying long has certainly shifted the leadership dynamic on teams. But somebody named me a national championship team for Carolina that had no leader or that was led by the coach, and I'll hang up and listen. But I'm going to get off this podcast now because I'm about to watch the Braves <laughs> wrap up this World Series against the Houston Astros. It's been on the beat live. It's been great. Gregory Halls, of course, been running it and running the chat. Greg Barnes, as always, brings his usual expertise here, and then we get the special treatment of I'm, Rel I'm joining us. I'm still a little bit unhinged about rail coming with stats you need to, and... <laughs> well we've got a game plan podcast for tomorrow evening you can bring some stats and get you get yourself back in gear on the stat line um, but boys it's been fun we're sponsored by johnny t-shirt johnny t-shirt.com of course sherelle loves some jimmy's seafood as well i do too need to get to baltimore and actually go there and hang out up there that would be fun do a podcast from up there maybe um and, and also that blue shark vodka that they talk about on the other podcast Boys, it's always a pleasure. Rate us, review us, subscribe, like, favorite, whatever he's called these days. Just do it. InsideCarolina.com's got you covered. Thanks, guys.